guys, welcome back to another riveting edition of Ocean Systems Design. Uh, this is part of a tutorial created for students studying the Ocean Naval Architectural Engineering Discipline at Memorial University of Newfoundland's Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Today's tutorial is intended to provide an introductory example of a hull analysis process using computer-aided analysis. Furthermore, we're also going to look at how this approach might be used to augment your hull design to conform to commonly accepted design criteria. The objective of today's lecture is to amplify your knowledge of methods of hull analysis using computer tools to increase uh, the accuracy and decrease the time expenditure required to rapidly assess the preliminary floatable lengths of your hull design. As you may recall from your education in hydrostatics, a floatable lengths curve is a traditional and still relevant means of determining, in the first instance, the location of the main subdivision bulkheads of a ship in its early stages of its design uh, in order to provide a desired measure of survivability after parallel flooding uh, across its breadth. It may be apparent to you that the floodable length varies with the position in the ship and with the permeability of the space into which the flooding is admitted. Consequently, the production of floodable length curves is a time-intensive, highly iterative set of calculations that can be done manually but are increasingly performed by leveraging the extreme computational efficiency of computers. This tutorial is aimed at procedural steps using a popular software package, so that's about as deep as I'm going to dive into the theory. If you're new to damage stability techniques, I suggest you consult Volume 1 of the Principles of Naval Architecture or a foundation text in hydrostatics, such as Basic Ship Theory by Tupper and Rawson uh, or Applied Naval Architecture by Zubali. Let's see, what else is really good? Um, I think the cats down at MIT use Introduction to Naval Architecture by Gilmer and Johnson. And I don't know what the midshipmen are using at the US Naval Academy, but it used to be Gilmer and Johnson too, so let's go with that. Uh, any of those texts are uh, really good foundation documents and they'll provide an overview of the theory. For a detailed manual procedure, you'll probably have to consult the seminal paper from the early 20th century by Schurichauer, uh, which is available through SNAMI, I think. And on the channel here in the hydrostatics playlist, I have a worked example using a very basic geometry so that you can focus on the calculation procedure. So with that said, by the end of today's lecture, you should be able to identify essential maxer commands used for conducting floodable lengths analyses, populate the software with necessary inputs, and interpret the analysis to make necessary changes to your concept design. As we transition to the computer demonstration, begin by opening your model in MaxSurf Modeler. Now go to Data, Calculate Hydrostatics. This option will give hydrostatic data for your vessel as designed thus far. Note your displacement and your vertical center of gravity. Okay, now close out and enter stability. Now if you haven't adjusted your coordinates and frame of reference, I suggest you do so. If you don't know how that should be set up, there's a video on the channel that demonstrates the basics of reference frames. Open your design and stability. Since this is not our first time working with this model, as this is the model I used in the tank and bulkhead definitions videos, I'm going to select Read Sections. But if this is your first time bringing the model into Hydromax, you'll want to select Calculate New Sections. We're going to leave the precision at medium, and if you're running a decent PC, you can probably bump up the number of stations. But this isn't necessary unless you have a complicated geometry. Uh, in general, 50 stations usually works. If, when we get to the analysis portion, your analysis keeps failing to converge on a solution, a first troubleshooting step would be to increase the number of stations. This permits more precise integration of spaces, but it comes at a cost. It is computationally expensive. I'm running a beast of a graphics PC, so I'm going to illustrate with a high number of stations so we can see what's going on. Let's begin prepping the model for analysis. I'll start by improving my visibility of what's going on by toggling on the section, water plane, and margin line visibility features. Maximizing the viewport, I can already see a common problem here. When we import designs from other programs into MaxSurf, the software reads and assumes a top surface from the data and assigns the margin line of the vessel accordingly. In the viewport, you can see the bulkhead deck is identified as the cyan line with the purple margin line correlating to this assignation. Now, look closely at my bulbous bow. The software has mistakenly assumed that the bulb is an extension of my uppermost watertight deck, which in literature or designs may commonly be called the bulkhead deck or the weather deck. If we continued with the calculation using this margin line, 
it should be immediately apparent to you that at anything but the most unrealistically small displacements, the margin line would be immersed just by the action of the vessel sitting in the water at its given displacement, causing an immediate failure of the criteria. So to solve this, I'm going to manually edit my margin line. Restore the viewport so we can see what we're doing and select the margin line points window icon. Now, if I scroll down the inputs, we can immediately identify where the assigned values completely go off the rails and stop making sense. Clicking on a relevant cell, I can highlight the whole cell. Holding down the shift key and pressing the down arrow on the keyboard, I can select all relevant cells en masse and then press the delete key or head to the edit menu and select delete margin line point and in the profile viewport I can see my vessel's margin line updates in real time. With my margin line repaired, let's go to the analysis menu and select trim. I have no pre-assigned trim condition on my vessel, so I'll leave my LCG options at default so that the system initially calculates the LCG as if the vessel was sitting at zero trim in the water. Similarly, as I have yet to assign any equipment weights, ballast, or superstructure that may change my center of gravity at this initial stage of my design, I'll continue forward on the assumption that my center of gravity is located at the geometric vertical center of gravity of my vessel. Of course, if your design is at a more mature stage of development, you may need to apply more appropriate and updated information. Click OK and then go back into the Analysis menu and select the Displacement option. To calculate the curves of floatable lengths, MaxSurf requires inputs, including the range of displacements for which the vessel should be considered to exist and operate. Once again, these conditions vary based on your vessel's particular size, operational profile, and any regulatory or class-based rules imposed on your vessel design. In my case, I am designing assuming that my vessel will probably have a number of load cases including a light ship, deep departure, heavy and light arrival conditions, etc. In your case, you may only be concerned with the subdivision load line for your vessel, which of course is dictated by your design standard, so you may need to do a little research to determine the appropriate value for your design. In any event, I have concluded from my parametric design analysis that my light ship displacement will be in the range of 5,000 tons and my design deep departure condition will present a vessel at 14,731 tons. So I'm going to round up here and enter values of 5,000 and 15,000 tons, and I'll enter 11 increments so the system will generate floodable length curves at intervals of 1,000 tons of displacement. Now if it's not obvious, you cannot and should not simply parrot my inputs here. You need to apply some critical thinking and identify what makes sense for your design. Alright, so I'm happy with that. And I'm going to go ahead and select OK, and with the input pop-up closed, I'll once again proceed up to the Analysis menu and, and select the Permeability option. Now, throughout your vessel, various compartments may have different permeabilities, and you can add permeability cells, and the software will conduct the analysis for you at these varying permeabilities, permitting you to build a composite floodable length curve. However, since I'm not sure where all my compartmentation will be, or what will comprise each compartment, I'm going to input a single value of 0.95 for now, which simply means every hypothetical compartment length identified in the analysis is assumed to be 95% permeable, which of course is a pretty awful state to be in, but it gives us a nice conservative starting point, which is not absurdly unrealistic. Last, using the analysis menu, I'll select my criteria. When we do floodable length criteria, we can choose some sort of deck edge immersion or margin line immersion. I'm going to use the standard practice, which is a margin line immersion. I'm going to make sure that my tick boxes for maximum trim angle, maximum transverse GM, and maximum longitudinal GM are all selected. In this case, I'll leave them at a pretty standard value, leaving it free to trim to 10 degrees. And I'm going to look for a minimum transverse and minimum longitudinal GM of 0.2 meters, which is pretty consistent with a number of standard class rules. Now that all my base inputs have been defined, I'll select Start Analysis and go make a sandwich while my computer goes apoplectic from the calculation I've requested it to perform. No, but seriously, don't be surprised if this takes a couple of minutes for your PC to crunch through. You can see in the viewport, the computer is proceeding through an iterative cycle of progressive flooding, increasingly longer compartments centered at different ordinates along the ship's length. When it reaches a condition that results in any portion of the margin line touching the water line at a given displacement, it declares a failure state and abandons the analysis for a new iteration of different conditions. So now that my computer has done in minutes what used to take some poor junior engineer months, we can examine the floodable length plot that has been auto-generated for us. You might observe that for each displacement, a separate distinct curve has been generated. 
Now we have arrived at the crux of the analysis, and the million dollar question is, what the hell do we do with it? First, let's click and drag on any individual line, and you'll see that the tracking cursor follows the floodable length curve while reporting the selected displacement condition, permeability setting, and longitudinal position of this imaginary flooded compartment center, and they're all displayed in the lower left corner of the graph window. Similarly, we can read the total permissible floodable length from the intersection point with the vertical axis. Now let's actually use the results to ascertain an appropriate degree of basic subdivision. First, right-click anywhere on the graph window and select Graph Data Format. Tick the Compartment Lengths option, the Vessel Profile option, and input 2 for the Max Compartment Standard, and then press OK. These options will permit us to see the compartment lengths on our graph as we enter them, and the graph now displays the outline of the vessel profile, which suits my eye and helps me visualize compartment or bulkhead locations as they are situated along the vessel a little more effectively. Finally, I usually arbitrarily set the compartment standard to 2, because this is a fairly common requirement consistent with SOLAS standards for any ship compartmentalization, when the ship is of any real appreciable length. The caveat, as always, is that I'm generalizing the instructions here. The specific requirements appropriate for your vessel are always subject to tailoring to align with your selected design standard. As a quick aside, uh, if you're the particular sort, you can right click on the graph and access a number of cosmetic options to suit your individual aesthetic. Okay, end sidebar. Back in the realm of what matters, let's see what effect adding watertight compartmentation has on our graph. Then go to Edit and select the Add Bulkhead option, or press anywhere in the definition window and type Control A and populate a new bulkhead. Remember to apply appropriate guidance from your design codes, such as crash and machinery bulkheads, to satisfy your design requirements. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and add some randomly located bulkheads so we can observe the effect they have on the graph. I've gone ahead and added bulkheads at 0 meters, 15 meters, 45 meters, 70 meters, 90 meters, and 110 meters. Consider the graph output. Notice the bright red triangles. The peak of each triangle represents the floodable length created by that compartmentation, while the span of the triangle indicates the compartment length created as a result of the bulkhead placements. The larger faint red triangles present the same information but for a two compartment standard. The floodable lengths curve is a convenient visualization of initial acceptability of watertight subdivisions. If your triangular peaks lie below the floodable length curve, the compartmentation passes this most basic fundamental criteria. Alternatively, if the triangular peaks intersect a curve, the standard is not met. In this case, the compartmentation is appropriate for a one compartment standard, but we can see that it fails for a large number of our more likely displacements. Thus, I need to add more bulkheads to further subdivide my vessel. When making these adjustments, remember that good design will be a balance of safety without over-constraining the design. So an over-compartmentalized design comes with its own list of frustrations for your client. Strive for design that meets your regulatory requirements, but don't overreach. You're looking for the Goldilocks zone here. For those of you who get that reference, great. For those of you that don't, find some time to read a fable. I'd suggest you start with Goldilocks and the Three Bears. While I've been digressing about children's literature, I've made some adjustments to my bulkhead definitions, and now you can see the vessel conforms to a two-compartment standard at all displacements, albeit not necessarily to any class rules. That concludes the demo portion of this tutorial. To summarize what I introduced today, we looked at the necessary inputs for computer-driven floodable lengths analysis. They include initial trim, displacement, and permeability values. Then, we ran a floodable length analysis to produce a set of floodable length curves. We reviewed how to interpret and make changes to the graph, and likewise input bulkhead definitions to conform with a one and two compartment standard. At this point, you should be able to complete a floodable length analysis in your own design and assign bulkheads as necessary according to the output of your curves and the guidance provided by your selected standard. If you're a little rusty on the theory behind floodable length analysis, you can refresh these concepts by checking out our video in the Introduction to Hydrostatics playlist. If you're curious how we did one of these things in the days predating mass computing, 
Like I mentioned in the introduction, I have a worked example for simplified geometry in another video in that same set of tutorials. So if you're really keen to develop your knowledge, check those out. I mean, or don't, I'm not going to tell you how to invest your time. Anyways, that wraps it up for this tutorial. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what you're learning here, please give the video a thumbs up. It really makes my day to see people getting some value from these. Don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date on the latest releases. If you've got any questions or feedback, I'd love to hear it. Leave them in the comments or email me directly and I'll get back to you. I reply to everyone, so thanks for the support and take care.